Hello everyone, this is Sylvain Rochon. Uh, hello to all the peaceful revolutionaries out there. I'm glad to see you again. Um, <laughs> I'm really not time. I got I got stuff all over the place going on, so I'm creating videos pretty much any time I want now. But I'm uh, having a little bit of time today. This is Saturday. Uh, some really interesting stuff going on in biotechnology, so I didn't want to wait uh, next few days to uh, to provide this to you. Um, but uh, new research about genetic modification, uh, healing with diseases, major, major update in the world of genetics and lots and lots of investments going into this particular research of gene editing. Uh, so we're talking about revolution as always uh, in, in, this, uh, in this blog, in this video. In this case, we're talking about medical revolution, also eugenics. This is a technology called CRISPR. Uh, using the Cas9 protein that's present in bacteria. Anyway, there's there's a bunch of research. I'm going to let you let you explore that a little bit, um, and I'm going to share the the video with you from a TED talk that uh, from the researcher uh, Jennifer Dudna, that is responsible for uh, that research from that Berkeley University in California. But uh, in a real nutshell, it's uh, it blows the mind the possibilities and it's already moving to practical application uh, in the next couple of years. So we're all going to be able to benefit from it. So here's the TED Talk. It's about 15 minutes directly from Jennifer Dudna. You can get a real good sense from what this is. And we're, we're going to come back later and talk, and talk a bit about it. A few years ago, with my colleague Emmanuel Charpentier, I invented a new technology for editing genomes. It's called CRISPR-Cas9. The CRISPR technology allows scientists to make changes to the DNA in cells that could allow us to cure genetic disease. You might be interested to know that the CRISPR technology came about through a basic research project that was aimed at discovering how bacteria fight viral infections. Bacteria have to deal with viruses in their environment, and we can think about a viral infection like a ticking time bomb. A bacterium has only a few minutes to diffuse the bomb before it gets destroyed. So many bacteria have in their cells an adaptive immune system called CRISPR that allows them to detect viral DNA and destroy it. Part of the CRISPR system is a protein called Cas9 that's able to seek out and cut and eventually degrade uh, viral DNA in a specific way. And it was through our research to understand the activity of this protein Cas9 that we realized that we could harness its function as a genetic engineering technology, a way for scientists to delete or insert specific bits of DNA into cells with incredible precision that would offer opportunities to do things that really haven't been possible in the past. The CRISPR technology has already been used to change the DNA in the cells of mice and monkeys, other organisms as well. Chinese scientists showed recently that they could even use the CRISPR technology to change genes in human embryos. And scientists in Philadelphia showed they could use CRISPR to remove the DNA of an integrated HIV virus from infected human cells. The opportunity to do this kind of genome editing also raises various ethical issues that we have to consider, because this technology can be employed not only in adult cells, but also in the embryos of organisms, including our own uh, species. And so together with my colleagues, I have called for a global conversation about the technology that I co-invented so that we can consider all of the ethical and societal implications of a technology like this. What I want to do now is I want to tell you uh, what the CRISPR technology is, what it can do, where we are today, and why I think we need to take a prudent path forward in the way that we employ this technology. When viruses infect a cell, they inject their DNA. And in a bacterium, the CRISPR system allows that DNA to be plucked out of the virus and inserted in little bits into the chromosome, the DNA, of the bacterium. 
And these integrated bits of viral DNA get inserted at a site called CRISPR. CRISPR stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats. A big mouthful. You can see why we use the acronym CRISPR. It's a mechanism that allows cells to record over time the viruses that they have been exposed to. And importantly, those bits of DNA are passed on to the cell's progeny. So cells are protected from viruses not only in one generation, but over many generations of cells. This allows the cells to keep a record of infection. And as my colleague Blake Wiedenheft likes to say, the CRISPR locus is effectively a genetic vaccination card in cells. Once those bits of DNA have been inserted into the bacterial chromosome, the cell then makes a little copy of a molecule called RNA, which is orange in this picture, that is an exact replicate of the viral DNA. RNA is a chemical cousin of DNA, and it allows interaction with DNA molecules that have a matching sequence. So those little bits of RNA from the CRISPR locus associate, they bind to protein called Cas9, which is white in the picture, and form a complex that functions like a sentinel in the cell. It searches through all of the DNA in the cell to find sites that match the sequences in the bound RNAs. And when those sites are found, as you can see here, the blue molecule is DNA. This complex associates with that DNA and allows the Cas9 cleaver to cut up the viral DNA. Makes a very precise uh, break. So we can think of the Cas9 RNA sentinel complex like a pair of scissors that can cut DNA. It makes a double-stranded break in the DNA helix. And importantly, this complex is programmable. So it can be programmed to recognize particular DNA sequences and make a break in the DNA at that site. As I'm going to tell you now, we recognize that that activity could be harnessed for genome engineering to allow cells to make a very precise change to the DNA at the site where this break was introduced. That's sort of analogous to the way we use a word processing program to fix a typo in a document. The reason we envisioned using the CRISPR system for genome engineering is because cells have the ability to detect broken DNA and repair it. So when a plant or animal cell detects a double-stranded break in its DNA, it can fix that break either by pasting together the ends of the broken DNA with a little tiny change in the sequence at that position, or it can repair the break by integrating a new piece of DNA at the site of the cut. So if we have a way to introduce double-stranded breaks into DNA at precise places, we can trigger cells to repair those breaks by either the disruption or incorporation of new genetic information. So if we were able to program the CRISPR technology to make a break in DNA at the position at or near a mutation causing cystic fibrosis, for example, we could trigger cells to repair that mutation. Genome engineering is actually not new. It's been in development since the 1970s. We've had technologies for sequencing DNA, for copying DNA, and even for manipulating uh, DNA. And these technologies were very uh, promising, but the problem was that they were either inefficient or they were difficult enough to use that most scientists had not adopted them for use in their own laboratories or certainly for, any, for uh, many clinical uh, applications. So the opportunity to take a technology like uh, CRISPR and utilize it has appeal because of its uh, relative simplicity. We can think of older uh, genome engineering technologies as, uh, similar to having to rewire your computer each time you want to run a new piece of software, whereas the CRISPR technology is like software for the genome. We can program it easily using these little bits of RNA. So once a double-stranded break is made in DNA, we can induce repair and thereby potentially achieve astounding things, like being able to correct mutations that cause sickle cell anemia or cause Huntington's disease. 
I actually think that the first applications of the CRISPR technology are going to happen in the blood, where it's relatively easier to deliver this tool into cells compared to solid tissues. Right now, a lot of the work that's going on applies to animal models of human disease, such as mice. The technology is being used to make very precise changes that allow us to, to study the way that these、uh, changes in the cell's DNA affect either a tissue or, in this case, an entire organism. Now, in this example, the CRISPR technology was used to disrupt a gene by making a tiny change in the DNA in a gene that is responsible for the black. Coat color of these mice. Imagine that these white mice differ from their pigmented litter mates by just a tiny change at one gene in the entire genome, and they're otherwise completely normal. And when we sequence the DNA from these animals, we find that the change in the DNA has occurred at exactly the place where we induced it using the CRISPR technology. Additional experiments are going on in other animals that are useful for、uh, creating、uh, models for human disease,、uh, such as monkeys. And here we find that we can use these systems to test the application of this technology in particular tissues. For example, figuring out how to deliver the CRISPR tool into cells. We also want to understand better how to control the way that DNA is repaired after it's cut. And also to figure out how to、uh, control and limit any kind of off-target or unintended、uh, effects of using the technology. I think that we will see a clinical application of this technology, certainly in adults, within the next 10 years. I think that it's likely that we will see、uh, clinical trials and possibly even approved therapies within that time, which is a very exciting、uh, thing to think about. And because of the excitement around this technology, there's a lot of interest in、uh, startup companies that have been、uh, founded to commercialize the CRISPR technology, and lots of venture capitalists that have been investing in these companies. But we have to also consider that the CRISPR technology can be used for things like enhancement. Imagine that we could try to engineer humans that have enhanced properties, such as stronger bones or Less susceptibility to cardiovascular disease,、um, or even to have properties that we would consider maybe to be desirable, like a different eye color or、uh, to be taller, things like that.、Um, uh, designer humans, if you will.、Um, right now, the genetic information to understand what types of genes would give rise to these traits are mostly not known. But it's important to know that the CRISPR technology gives us a tool to make. Such changes once that knowledge becomes available. This raises a number of ethical questions that we have to to carefully consider, and、um, this is why I and my colleagues have called for a global pause in any clinical application of the CRISPR technology in human embryos to give us time to really consider all of the the various implications of of doing so. And actually, there's an important precedent. For such a pause from the 1970s, when scientists got together to call for a moratorium on the use of molecular cloning until the safety of that technology could be、uh, tested carefully and, and、uh, validated. So, genome-engineered humans are not with us yet, but this is no longer science fiction. Genome-engineered animals and plants are happening right now. And this puts in front of all of us a huge responsibility to consider carefully both the unintended consequences as well as the intended impacts of a scientific breakthrough. Thank you. Jennifer, this is a technology with a huge. Uh, consequences you pointed out. Your attitude about asking, you can call it a pause or a moratorium or a,、uh, or a quarantine, is、uh, incredibly responsible.、Uh, there are, of course, the therapeutic results of this, but then there are the non-therapeutic ones, and they seem to be the ones gaining traction, particularly in the media.、Uh, this is one of the last, the latest issues of the Economist. Editing humanity is all about genetic enhancement; it's not about therapeutics, right? 
What kind of reactions did you get back in March from your colleagues in the science world when you asked or when you suggested that we should actually pause this for a moment and think about it? My colleagues were actually, I think, delighted to have the opportunity to discuss this openly. Um, it's interesting that as I talk to people, my, my scientific colleagues as well as others, there's a wide variety of viewpoints about this. So clearly it's a topic that needs uh, careful consideration and discussion. So there's a big meeting happening in December that Correct. you and your colleagues are calling together with the Academy of Science and others. What is your expectation? What do you hope that we come out of the meeting practically? Well, I hope that we uh, can air the views of many different individuals and, and uh, stakeholders who want to think about how to use this technology responsibly. It may not be possible to come up with a consensus point of view, but I think we should at least understand what all the issues are as we go forward. Now, colleagues of yours like George Church, for example, at Harvard, they say, yeah, ethical issues basically are just a question of, of safety. We test and test and test again in animals and in labs, and then once we feel it's safe enough, we move on to uh, humans. Uh, and so that's kind of the other school of thought, is uh, we should actually use this opportunity and really go for it. Is there a possible split happening in the, in the science community about this? I mean, are we going to see some people holding back because they have ethical cons concerns and some others just going for it because some countries under-regulate or don't regulate at all? Well, I think with any new technology, especially something like this, um, there, there are going to be a variety of viewpoints. And um, I think that's, that's perfectly understandable. I think that in the end, this technology will be used for, for human genome engineering. Um, but I think that to do that without careful consideration and discussion of the risks and, and the, the potential complications would not be responsible. Now, there are a lot of technologies in other fields of science that are developing exponentially, pretty much like, uh, like yours. I'm thinking about artificial intelligence, about autonomous robots and so. Uh, no one seems, aside from uh, autonomous warfare robots, nobody has seems to have launched a similar discussion in those, in those fields and calling for a moratorium. Do you think that your discussion may serve as a blueprint for other fields? Well, I think it's hard for scientists to get out of the laboratory, uh, speaking for myself. It's, uh, it's a little bit uncomfortable to do that. But I do think that um, being involved in the genesis of this uh, really puts me and my colleagues in a position of responsibility. And I would say that I, I certainly hope that other technologies will be uh, considered in the same uh, way, just as we would want to consider something that could have uh, implications in, in other fields besides biology. Jennifer, thanks for coming to TED. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Welcome back. Uh, I hope your mind is blown because this is huge. This is huge. I have a training in biotechnology, you know, biochemistry, chemical engineering, kind of mixed up together. This is mind-boggling what this is going on. Um, gene therapy has been around for a long time, but uh, generally what we could do uh, to modify genes essentially is insert new genes. So we were able to create like phosphorescent uh, uh, rats and bunnies uh, by inserting a gene from, uh, from medusas, you know, jellyfish essentially. Into, into another gene. So we're able to insert full genes into other genomes to create certain effects. And that's how we did a lot of our genetic modified food, you know, for, for plants that we wanted to grow further north. For example, we insert a, a gene of, uh, for frost resistance, for example, that comes from, another, from a, uh, a cold water fish into some of the plants so that they are resistant to cold and frost in northern climates and then you know the plant can grow there for instance all that stuff so we're able to do that but that doesn't really resolve any of the genetic diseases where the problem is a defective gene it's not the presence or absence of a gene it's like a gene is defective and the mechanism in the body some mechanism in the body doesn't work properly uh, but this CRISPR mechanism which comes from bacteria from my understanding it's something that is found in nature we use we came to understand it, and we came to leverage and uh, to be able to use it. Uh, this, in fact, allows us to target a specific gene that is defective, and then using a template from RNA uh, to modify, to cut it, identify the problem with it, and and uh, and then modify the gene so it would be repaired and become functional again. So all sorts of diseases like that are genetic, like cystic fibrosis, Tay-Sachs disease, uh, some of the cancers that are that are um, genetic, 
uh, sickle cell disease, Huntington's, and a lot more, can be treated theoretically using this, this exact technique just by editing the, the bad gene. And that also means that if you, if you are affected by a genetic disease of some sort, uh, you can get cured, but also potentially your, your progeny can also be, uh, can avoid being in, uh, receiving those bad genes because you repair a gene in your body, then you can't transmit it anymore, which is a problem with congenital uh, and genetic diseases. In addition, what's really cool about this is that we're looking at be able to cure uh, diseases that are that are not genetic, like, as in integrated into your own genetic code, but uh, that are from, come from retroviruses, for example, that use the genetic code to hide, uh, like our herpes viruses, for example, they kind of hide and you, you kind of it sticks around forever. While we can edit those out and kind of make make them inactive, for example, as a potential application, HIV as well that does a lot of funny stuff like that, kind of hides and it gets modified. We can target those inside the immune system and remove. The, the AIDS virus from there in certain ways. Potentially, we still have to need to do the further research specific to each disease. But this, these are all possibilities. Another cool possibility now is that we can also further do eugenics, which is the modification of, uh, of genes to improve, like a you know custom uh, genes we can insert into your, our own body, modifying certain genes so that they 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 get improved, uh, change eye colors, and these these different things much much easier, and essentially like designer babies and designer pets and designer all this stuff become become much better possibility and all this stuff what's really cool is that this technique is really really easy and cheap it's like re leveraging a, a natural mechanism that does it all on its own you just need to program the protein the cas9 protein to, to to latch onto a specific gene and it essentially does a job on its own you don't need to have like whole Whole, a whole bunch of chemicals and things like that. So lots and lots of potential uh, around it. Uh, so since the research has come out about, uh, my understanding is about two or three years ago, a lot of venture capitalists, angels, and investors invested in a lot of startups that that saw this research and decided to, to jumpstart their business to cure all sorts of stuff, including Editas Medicine, who are doing one of the first real human trials on, on curing a, a very rare uh, eye, genetic eye disorder, uh, and if they succeed uh, before 2007 in, in in doing a cure for the eye disease in human trial, the FDA and other regulatory organizations will allow that cure to go out there to the public to be available, as well as probably be more amenable to uh, to approve other treatments. Uh, and applications of CRISPR for different other diseases. Uh, so instead of treating and uh, alleviating symptoms of a lot of these diseases that are, and some of which are mortal, like cystic fibrosis, we're able to cure them uh, and, and remo remove and modify, and it, you get it back. Well, we can we can fix it again if if it's a case of retroviruses, for example. So huge, huge impact. So I'm going to put some more links. Uh, in the down below on Editus Medicine, for example, and a couple other things so you can follow a little bit what, what this is about, do a little bit deeper research. But this is extremely exciting. I hope you get excited about it. If you want to see more research around genetics uh, and these kind of things, and you, you or you see something that's really revolutionary or exciting, I'll be really interested in reading about it, and I can post something about that as well. So you just have to write to me about it, and I'll, uh, I'll do my analysis and research you know, I'll be able to do my thing. All right. So keep the revolution going. Keep the research going. Really happy to, uh, to be with you guys today. Have a good weekend. Ciao.